What a great cinema sound and what an amazing morning. Thank you so much for joining us at the Science and Innovation Day. A very warm welcome to you. And I'm so glad you're here that we, because without you, this conference is nothing. My name is Matthias Goldman. I am the CEO of a Swedish think tank called in Swedish FURES, but it's actually much better in English because then it becomes FORCE. FORCE is the Forum for Reforms, Entrepreneurship and Sustainability. We try and be the bridge between research, policy and business, which means that we try and have science and innovation days every day of the week. But it's rare that we have science and innovation days like this one with such a prominent group of speakers. I can't say which one I'm the most excited about because one beats the next, beats the next. Just incredible bunch of speakers for you. And an amazing crowd of people here. Let me go through some of the details before we get to the speakers. First of all, um, first of all, I gotta do the stewardess thing. If there is an emergency, we need to evacuate like this. Those are the emergency exits there, and there's also emergency exits here in the front and in the rear, just like in the airplane. And then let me uh, introduce you to the hashtag SID2018, because we know we have friends and colleagues who could not be here today, who are somewhere else in the world, who had some other appointments, or who simply didn't realize how great this was going to be. Share your thoughts and insights with them on social media, and also remind them that we are live, and I want to greet all the people who are following us around Sweden and around the world. We are live at the scienceandinnovationday.com, www.scienceandinnovationday.com on Meet the Universitet's YouTube channel. That also means that when you feel, hey, this is something I really want to share with some of my colleagues, or I want to get back to and listen again later because maybe I didn't understand exactly everything, there's the opportunity to go back. And that also means that you don't need to take picture of every slide that's up here because they're going to be for you at the YouTube channel. I also want to introduce to you what we have here, the Menti. You know it's on your phone. We use the menti.com to first get to know each other a little bit better, get to know your expectations in a while, and then at every speaker, this is the way you communicate your questions and your comments that you want to post to the speakers. I'm going to be looking at this, and I'm going to make sure that the questions that you have are going to be posted to the speakers as well. But let's bring up the phones for those of you who haven't done it yet. Go to menti.com. Let me assure you, it doesn't cost anything. There's not going to be any commercials. You don't need to download anything. You simply go to menti.com. I'm going to do that at the same time with you. Oh, it disappeared now. Here we have it. Menti.com 8110.30. Can we have it back here, please? I hate it when everything goes well, when you practice and, re and rehearse, because then... So for those of you who haven't voted yet, go into menti.com with 81, 10, 30, and tell me whom you represent of the uh, different institutions that we have. Great. We're going to come back to that one. We're going to keep that as a surprise for us for the time being whom we represent. And we're going to go to uh, the main points of today's program. If we can have that instead. No, we can't. Which means that we're going to be able to focus on... Here we go. We're back online. This is, and if you haven't voted yet, please do so, because it's important for the speakers to realize who's here in the audience. So we see that companies and universities are at a tie. There's roughly exactly the same amount of company representatives and universities here. There is some from the public sector and there is one until now who's other. Who's this other? Well, you're the other. What are you? Research Institute. Wow, you, you would be able to vote at least twice, I think, right? <laughs> so in some way in between university and public sector. Other. Great. And if you haven't voted yet, please continue doing so. But this is the important thing that we get as a message to the speakers. A roughly equal division between companies and universities. And let's move straight to the second question where we want to ask you 
humane expectations for the day because we want to make sure that we're not here for us, we're here for you. So we want to make sure that what you expect is what we try and deliver for you. What are your expectations on Science and Innovation Day? That should be the next question that just pops up on your phone after the first one. And let's start seeing some results. I see that already seven people voted. Um, and you just put a word there in English. Uh, if your expectation is networking, you put networking. If your expectation is lunch, you put lunch, things like that. We would love to start seeing the results, please. Here we go. See, this is like a word cloud where we see that many people say, I want to be inspired. We have networking and some people even put it in Swedish just to be on the safe side, Netwerke. We want interesting stuff. We want knowledge. We want to know about the future. We want to have interaction and we want to get insights and we want to be excited as well. We want to have Dishu, which I'm not sure. Where did Dishu disappear? Here. It keeps moving whenever I try and find it. Deju is somewhere here. It was in blue. Do you see Deju? Yeah. Who wrote Deju? I want to understand what that is. Is that short for French for déjeuner lunch? Maybe. Who wrote Deju? Well, it's okay. Maybe it's somebody who... Oh, you wrote Deju. What is it? Flexible ad adaptation? Fle Japanese for flexible adaptation. Wow, did you all get that? That's another word we're going to use here before the day is over. It's going to be a household word for us, the Deshu moment. Can you say that, the Deshu moment? Yeah, let's try and use that. So this continues to grow, but this is enough for the speakers who are already here to start realizing when this is what we need to deliver on. And incidentally, the first speaker, even though very briefly, is myself. So I'm going to have to try and start delivering myself. And we did two mentees. We're going to try a different thing also. It's old-fashioned, but it works greatly usually. It's just hands up. Who here is not Swedish? And who here is Swedish? So there's a 60-40 or 65-35 divide, and then there were several people who actually voted twice, which is a good thing. You feel that you're both from elsewhere and from here. That's the Swedish spirit beginning to grow on you. But let me direct myself mainly towards those of you who are not Swedish and give you a very brief introduction to Sweden as the introductory remarks for this conference. Sweden is a tiny country. In fact, in one of the areas that I focus on the most and the areas that I know that many of you feel as being tremendously important, climate, Sweden's emissions are tiny. So if we look at the world as 100%, of course, of global, global emissions, how much would Sweden's be? The world is 100%, Sweden's emission, how many percent? What was that? One. That's a great guess. Thank you. We need, we need to go further down for 1%. 0. 0 0.5, we need to go further down. Come on. Another guess? 0. 0.2, who said that? You win the nearest guess award. So 0.2% in, in, in current terms, Swedish emissions of the global total of climate impact is 0.15%. But then you can add stuff that's not technically Sweden's emissions, it's somebody else's. Like this suit was maybe made in Thailand, this watch probably in Switzerland, this... Uh, uh, this computer may be in China, but all used in Sweden, so maybe it's our emissions anyway, and then it adds up to 0 0.3. But that's still so little, so that if Sweden theoretically were to reduce our emissions now to zero, secretly, nobody would be able to notice. Those sort of global CO2 impact assessors around the world would not uh, notice. So if we were to shut off every factory, shut off en every engine, breathe in and then don't breathe out again, the world would not notice. And as, you may, as most of us know, there's eight parties in parliament. One of them is more focused on other issues, but the other seven parties, they got together and said, well, we want to find a way for, to formulate Sweden's climate targets. And then they posed the exact same question as I did, but to begin with, how big our 
are our emissions. And when they realize that they're just 0.15%, they could easily have said, well, so it doesn't really matter then. But what they said was the exact opposite. They said, well, if our emissions are so small in a global uh, scope, uh, the only way we can make a difference is by being so great so that others will learn from us, from what we're doing, so that we can become the global help desk to call, so that we can become the permanent world exhibition to visit. And that is what became the climate law, the 1st of January this year, that by 20, 2030, we're going to have a 70% emissions reduction compared to 2010 in the transport sector. I know that some of you work for transport, so we're going to hear some things related to transport during the day. And by 2045, when many of you students at least will still be active, we are supposed to have net zero in Swedish emissions. You know that every country in the Paris agreements uh, had to deliver their climate proposals, which means that we know, we can compare, and we know that Sweden's climate emission targets are the toughest in the world. As a lot of us know, probably all of us know, we had elections just very recently. And then you know that of all the issues that were discussed in the elections, if you were to believe Donald Trump, you would expect people to say, well, safety, security, violence, that's the main issue that we need to discuss in these elections. But the number one climber and at the end of the election period, the most, single most important issue that we as voters said, this is what we need to discuss in Sweden, was climate. That was, of course, influenced by the record summer that we had. Not only record heat, but also record with how much the record was broken compared to the previous record. The droughts, the fires, the emergency slaughtering of the animals, and the very poor harvest that we're starting to see now. And then... We had the election day on the 9th of September. Then many people said, well, on election day, people left climate at home because those parties that had a very strong climate profile maybe didn't do all that well. And when you ask the voters when they left the polling station, what made you decide on which party to vote for? Climate was not on top, but at the very bottom. Number 17 out of 17 different issues discussed. So, did people really leave climate at home? No, it's the opposite. When people said climate is the most important thing that we need to discuss and that politics need to deliver on, and they said it's the least important when, least determining factor when I get to decide whom to vote for. In fact, they're saying politicians of every party, well, maybe all seven parties, maybe not the H1, of every party, we have faith in you. We have trust that you're going to be able to deliver on this. And uh, as you know, uh, we had the IPCC report last week on how we need to reduce our emissions very quickly, how we need much more science, much more innovation to start now to get to a point where we can stop global warming at 1.5 degrees. Because if we can't stop it at 1.5, the risk is very high that we cannot stop it at 2, 3, 4 degrees because then we have the runaway train. Then we have irreversible effects that we can no longer control. So we need to stop it at 1.5. And they said that on Monday, last Monday, last Tuesday, exactly a week from now, there was the EU meeting on climate and environment. The Swedish climate minister went there to say, we need to have stronger, tougher uh, EU legislation on uh, reducing emissions as the EU's proposal for the global climate negotiations in, in Katowice in Poland in December. And, and the environmental minister, Skog, she went also to Brussels, but to a different meeting, saying that the automotive sector needs to reduce their emissions much faster, because otherwise we're not going to reach the 1.5 degree target. Now, some of you might object to what I just said. The climate minister, Levin, the environment minister, Skog, there's no such thing. We don't even have a government in Sweden for the time being. We are about to break the Swedish, the, the European record. We'll see what happens, but we're now four weeks into a period of non-government. We only have an expeditionsminister. I'm not sure what that is in English, but it's a, it's a sort of in-between governments that can only do things that are necessary, self-evident, and cannot wait. 
And if they do anything else more than that, other parties will immediately object and say, you're not allowed to do that because you're not a proper government. You can only do what's necessary, self-evident, and cannot wait. So when the two ministers went and said, we need to reduce our emissions and we need to increase our targets, and nobody objected. Everybody said, that's fine, even though you're not a government, that's the right thing to do. That just proves that in Sweden, all parties agree that we need to have a much more stringent climate policy. And it proves that we, don't, we still don't know who won the election, but we certainly know which issue won. It was the climate issue, and it was the science and innovation touch of things, because that's the only way to reach those targets. Now remember, if we want to be the global help desk, and seven parties out of eight agree that by from year to year, all the way to 2045, that's where we're going to be. The global help desk, the permanent exhibition. Uh, we're not North Korea. So we cannot have that everybody walks in the exact same pace. If Sweden is going to be the global help desk permanent exhibition, somebody in Sweden needs to move faster than the others. And Sweden is such a tiny country, so they can easily be one of us here. It can easily be meet the universitet among the universities. Those of you representing companies, it can easily be your companies showing the way. Those of you representing municipalities, why should your municipality not be the leading municipality in Sweden? And if you're the leading municipality in Sweden, which wants to be the country that leads the world, will then we become global, globally relevant. So that's my introductory remarks that we may think of ourselves as people in a medium-sized university or medium or small-sized company in a small country. But when we flip that coin, we realize we, are also, we also have a unique possibility to show the world the way. And when we want to show the world the way, we realize also that the IPCC said that can only be done by unprecedented action which means that we need more science and more innovation, which means that we're at the exact right place at the exact right moment. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you noticed this is more of a trial because we're going to have longer speakers afterwards with ten min full 10 minutes for questions. We don't have time for much questions now, which is great. It's just free. But it also proves that we are starting to understand how this works. Is the vision for the future society clear? Of course it's not. And I'm glad it's not because uh, the only thing we know about the future is that it's difficult to predict. And when we try, we often end up wrong. But we're going to get some great impact to have a more clear vision, at least of the future that we want. Do you think that we can stop the increase in global warming? Yes, I think we can. I was watching Germany beat Sweden 4 to 0, 65th minute. If we were not at least playing equal with Germany, we would not go to the world championship. And all the others, they left the room. They said there's no chance. That was 4 to 0. And then Sweden scored 1, 2, 3, 4. We qualified and we reached the quarterfinals because we will rise to the occasion. We will do it on stoppage time. We will do it with impact that we need to uh, deliver on, but we will do it at the last uh, minute. What if we engage many sectors of society to, to take action for urgent environment needs? Yes, please. We're going to discuss not only environment today, but environment is going to be one of the top of minds here when we see how can we engage science, business, and research and policy better. So we're going to keep that for us during the rest of the day. Now, who here usually goes or sometimes goes to music festivals? You nod, you do, you did me, I did also earlier. Uh, and you know that at this point in the morning, if there's music at all, it, it, it's usually not very interesting. The, the main acts are in the late afternoon or evening or night. This is not how the Science and Innovation Day works. We start with one of the most prominent speakers, not only here, but globally. We know that when we discuss science and innovation, nanotechnology is something that springs to mind immediately. How can we use that to deliver better on the goals that we need to deliver on? And then we have with us the Google number one ranked in, in nanotechnology, the 2017 Global Nano Energy Prize Award winner, and the 2018 ENI Award winner for energy, that is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Energy. We have with us Professor Song Lin Wang from Georgia Tech to 
help us understand better what nanotechnology can do for us. Please give him a very warm hand. It's a great honor, privilege, and this is the first time for me in this uh, town. And I've been in Sweden for seven, eight times, and I uh, have many interactions with many colleagues around the country. And it's very honored to be here, and I'm very inspired by the talk and the challenge we face in our society related to environment and energy and many things. And uh, based on my own research, I want to make some new proposals. And I'm also looking for not only scientific interaction, but also for industrial uh, communication as well as commercialization of some of the technology we are developing. Um, my talk focus on an invention we made a dozen years ago, and uh, as today we bring very many things even to market right now, I want to present you what we're looking for. One possible approach to help the environment as well as energy. As you look at this chart, this is dedicated to technology revolution we have experienced in the many past. In the first one, a steam engine was invented. The major power people use was coal. And later on, when the automobile aerospace engine came up, the majority was oil, liquid fuel. That's still the driving force today for many things. As we progress along microelectronics, as today people do nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, robotics, all this kind of internet of things, what are the energy we could be for us? And what are the new energy we're looking for that can help us to solve the world globing, global warming problem? So this, we try to explore the new opportunity. But if you look at all these revolutionaries, it all goes back to steam engine time. And people use heat to generate mechanical motions. And that was the first time using a machine to re replace labor. As a result, the train came up is because the fuel of coal, right? They, they drive to us. And most recently, you have other advanced engines as we use for aircraft and many other things. So this is the steam engine time. The law was thermodynamics, the conservation of energy convert heat to mechanical actions. As the world progress that uh, they generate electricity, use the mechanical actions, was Faraday's electromagnetic generator, and which was invented in 1831 for power generation. As progresses and up to 1900, have the AC current generator, which make a long distance transport of power possible. Okay, as a result, most recent one, we can build a very powerful power plant. And as you can see, this is a solve many problems we face in our society, but at the same time, due to power generations, emission from automobile industry, and many other things, we have new problem. But what we utilize this energy is such, <clears throat> is high quality energy. The energy we use coal, oil, those high quality energy which are irreversible. Once you use it, that's the end of it. So therefore we use high quality energy, use power plant to generate electricity. So you generate electricity and distribute to very many different homes to see this, and you widely distribute it. But those power will not backflow, will not backflow to reach the power plant. You can have concentrated power as we used to be. So this is, if you look at it's called thermodynamics, this can be called the entropy in energy science. We goes to dispersed it, distributed power distribution. That's our how the power reach our each family through wires and cables. That's what we use, okay? But furthermore, when we do power generation, regard what energy you have, the most useful one is electric power. Still the most effective one is heat engine plus electric generator get electricity. So these are the things we have been using and largely cause a lot of global warming as well, 
work plus other industry for that. So the near future we face, we cannot depart from this. This is still the backbone of our power technology. But what challenges us today is people use too many small things now. The timing changes. The change is this because each of us have a cell phone, maybe other things. In the future, you're going to have a lot more. So power all this electronics is what the internet things required. And it's expanding more and more. Big data, where the big data come from? It come from all these things. So therefore, we want to measure everything we, 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 we can measure. We want to know every location we need to know. All this is not a wired power. Use storage power or locally generate power. So it deviates from what we used to be. As you can see, this is a wider distributed power for that. In such a case that uh, called distributed energy, energy wider distributed in our society, but we can use solar energy, wind energy, thermal, mechanical energy to supplement all this need. And the uh, estimation shows that by 2025, there'll be 30 billion objects to be linked worldwide and powered to some extent with the detection right here. So what are the power delivery approach for us? Well, for example, sorry, those, uh, we can utilize the traditional power plant or we can use the storage units, distribute all the kind of things. But as a survey shows that if you rely on both storage and the major power, according to Cisco study, 90% of the internet of things will be impossible. And they show that if you use all this battery to power a lot of small things, the maintenance requires a lot of work. The internet thing will be impossible to be achieved. So what are the possibility? And they advocate the idea we pushed for more than 15 years ago called solar power system. Can we have the energy from the environment to utilize the energy dispersed environment? We used to be considered low quality, random, useless power for make small things. So this brings me back to uh, 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 some, more than 10 years ago when I published this paper. This was called Solve Power Nanotechnology. We can make nanotechnology small things. Can we make this solve power so it can operate independently, sustainably? Is this possible? If it's possible, how? If, if you know the possibility, can you make this efficient? So for the last 15 years, my research is looking for a new approach for solve, solve power nanotechnology. What we have to do differently? Let me show you a video. What you see here is such. Let me see. Okay. <clears throat> was you are familiar with electromagnet generator. That's this thing is about. What we invented a few years ago was use trouble electricity for power generation. You see the difference. You can see this one in order to generate power, it has run at a fast pace, higher frequency. This one runs at low frequency. You can see the output at low frequency is much higher than the traditional technology. Why? If you can, this provides a means to collect low frequency energy dispersed in our environment. Okay, what do we mean by low frequency? If you look at the power output for individual ones, the trouble electric nano generator, short TNG, and electromagnet generator, the electromagnet generator is quadratic function of frequency. So at a low frequency, the output is low. But this is linear with frequency. So at a low frequency, such as two hertz or three hertz frequency, this is much more effective than the other one. So, but the energy which is wasted in, in our environment, mostly low frequency energy, not high. Can we get them, use them? So this is our goal, this is our approach. And let me tell you the scientific side, how do we do it? And then I'll tell you what's the technology application, which may help you. If you order to do this, low vo at a low frequency, high voltage output, you see many lights flash at such, how do you do this? This will go back to a phenomena all of us know. Each of us know thunderstorm, electrostatics, which is familiar to us. This, according to human record, this had been 2,600 years old. They know thunderstorm, they know have a uh, discharge. 
But this is a complicated problem, but it's accomplished to us any time with us. If you look at the textbook in the middle school, physics book, you say, what is electricity? The first class, they talk about charge. So how do you get charge? Well, you get a glass tube and a fur, rub one against the other, you get charge. That's all the textbook says. And did not tell you how, why, but you got it. Nobody suspected it was wrong. Nobody believed that. That's what you got, right? But we know trouble electricity. We know that happened. Very complicated. If you talk about quantum mechanical side, it's very complicated. Even today, physics does not have very clear explanation. How does trouble electricity occur? Is a quantum mechanical phenomena happens any time with us? Room temperature, even higher temperature. Okay. So my goal today is not to explain how does this happen. We have some answers. My goal is that how would you utilize this for this? Because today we have a lot of industry people here want to show the application side. So let's see how the electricity was generated. If you have two dielectric medium, one sliding against the, one, the other one, on the surface, trouble electricity occurs. If you're just sliding them apart, you have the leakage field, which drives the electron to flow from one electrode to the other one to balance the field which give you a current flow here if you're sliding back and forth. So you can see this video we shot a few years ago. As you see, <clears throat> this piece sliding against the other one, it does not give you very high power, but very sufficient for many things. So what's the difference between this power compared to the power we use right now? Okay, there's a difference in the physics. What we have to utilize is a metal rod cut through the magnetic field Lorentz force drive the current flow, which is the, is the generator we use today, called conduction current. But what I introduce today goes to those four famous equations, Maxwell's equations, 1861. We, people use this one for communication, wireless communication, antenna design, do not use them for power generation. What we refer to is this term was introduced by Maxwell, is called displacement current. This displacement current is not the electric current of moving charge, not this, but a tiny variation of electric field. So this is the one, if you have the surface charge on the top and the bottom surfaces, if you tap it on this one, change the distance between the two, you change the electric field here, you get the power generated, the current flows. Even sometimes there's no wire, but there's a power transmitted. Okay, so this is a displacement current called capacitive current. That's what we use. If you look at, furthermore, if you two dielectric, one contact the other one, the trouble electricity occurs, then you separate them apart, and then this change of variation of electric field, which give you displacement current inside and the conduction current outside, and that's what you see. You see those light flash as you made an inch of this one because of this. So it's different fundamentally different. It's different from physics, from what we try to use, we use to use. But of course, you can derive the equations, how the current flow, but I will simplify this term. Let's say, for you, okay, you have two dielectric mediums, contact because of the surface charge, and you can work on the field distribution here, here, and here, use all the, this uh, equation here. What the important things here, it displaces the current, the standard term is this term. And two years ago, I add this term is because of polarization due to surface charge, which gave you ours the current we observed. So instead of spend a lot of time explaining what this current is about, all the math means, but I want to focus on applications. What you can utilize this? This can be utilized to harvest the low quality, disperse the energy for Internet of Things, for power, very many small electronics. So if we, based on such a principle, then we put in it in a tubular shape. You see, in the shoes insole here, this is about a two to three millimeter size. It's a tubular shape. Inside of the structure like this. So if, you, if the foot press this one, because the contact separation between the top and the bottom here, as a result, you'll be able to generate a small power of that. You see, this, you don't have to work hard, and this does not add any weight, but just add uh, a little bit thickness in your shoes and then, then, then you walk, you can generate a small power for here. You can imagine that used to be you can ha you need to have energy from a walking. It's not that easy. It's not easy. You have a gear, you have a mechanical transduction system. In ours, it's mostly organic materials with metal foils. You can do these purposes.
And uh, so this is uh, the insurance. And what are the choice materials? You can literally choose any materials. You can choose paper, you can choose fabric, you can choose a silicon. And this is what it is. You can use a silicon here. They twist the three round here, flexible, foldable, and you'll be able to have a power generation by this. So this can be shape adaptive. You can adapt to any shape of the surfaces for healthcare, human, uh, for the uh, uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, anything. You tap a different part of one, current signal signals generated here. So shape adaptable, use organic or soft materials for these purposes. You can also use this shape healable. You, you can use different polar function polar. You make this one, you use the knife to cut it, and after some temperatures, they, they recover themselves. And before and after, the performance almost no change. So therefore, you can use this material, make a shape adaptable, healable, soft uh, material made power generator, which used to be can make a solar, solar cell, uh, organic LED, but this use organic material for mechanical energy harvest. <clears throat> then you say, how much energy we can harvest? Well, we can make it one and a half feet, one and a half feet board. You put it on the surface here. A person freely walking generates about 2,000, 3,000 volts. This all lights flashes because the person walk, free walking here. And it's not very much power, but enough for some purposes. For some purpose, especially wide distributed units for Internet of Things, for sensor network, that's the power they need. So let me give you some examples for applications. Okay, first one is medical application. Power pacemaker is a big uh, uh, challenge for many things because the battery has to be changed once every three uh, three to five years. Or so okay, so we first one we try to use uh, the breathing of an animal to power a simulated pacemaker similar pacemaker we might want to use the breathing of an animal to drive this pacemaker for future use for human so implant medical device need a small power source now we made a lot more progress recently as we say large animals large animals we use the breathing of large animals bring once can power this pacemaker three times so we are moving forward so that used the implant medical devices use the energy each of our body has look at the future the future is this now the the pacemaker is in this shape in the future is self-powered because the power consumption of the pacemaker drops, but the power harvesting efficiency of our device goes up. So there's a crossover above which we can do that. So this is called self-powered device by that, right? What other material you can utilize? Do we need expensive, sophisticated equipment to make this one? The answer is no. You can use literally paper, fabric. This is used the fab fibers. If you have two fibers, because the contact of two different fibers, one against the other one, can cause trouble electricity between the two, and you can generate a power source here. So you can see this looks like a carpet here, but it's made of power shirt, power carpet here. So you can put on the floor here, somebody stepping that, there's power generated like that. They use the trouble electricity between the fibers between the fibers here, okay, fabric, fabric. And you can make this into address, uh, addressable, pixel addressable here. You tap in different positions, you get the, the signal out here for make a sensors use the conventional materials. You can choose the material for different purpose. You can use this uh, winding materials, for example, the tubular materials, you can wind a different structure here, make a core shell here, and you can make this ribbon shape here for biological sensing for body motion. And this can be stitched on a different part of the surface. When you move, when you, when you move any part of your body, there's a signal being generated. This is used to be for future robotics, healthcare, and security, very many different things. So you can see this kind of structure like that. All rely on a trouble electricity, trouble electricity. So when you, if somebody play a golf, and a different shape when they do it, at a different stage, you can detect the signal at a different stage here. You can record it that. And also, people can correction people's move when they are training, to be trained, play golf or other sports here. So this use the trouble electricity as a sensing mechanism to tell in any move, you follow the right 
pattern or not. This is the one. We can make this highly textured. You see, use the contact between two fiber here. You can addressable. If you touch different parts, the signal being generated at different parts here. So pixel addressable, this kind of sensing here. And we are developing this one. I hope to reach millimeter or even smaller pixel resolution so we can use it for other purposes as well. So we are not only looking for just one materials. We're looking for the system. The system is this because we have random energy, the energy which we normally do not use. So variable frequency, variable amplitude. But we need a system which have all the component we need to be functioning. So therefore, we need to design the materials, we design the structures, fabrication, all the measurements. For our nano generator part, we have three major components. The component is the energy harvesting part. Because our environment is variable, slower, faster, sometimes you have, sometimes not. But use the power management system and the storage. And once you store it, you can utilize for whatever purpose you need to. So we look for a system, not only just one material. It's a system that's included a power generator, power management, as energy storage. And as of all this one, we can have an integrated component. If you have a commercial product, if you have some existing electronics, we can work with you to make your device to be hopefully self-powered, okay? So we can have, a, this example shows a car key here. We can use this, charge this one, and a transmit signal about 30 yards away. You can see this was just shot a few years ago, and I was to make it simple. This is the power management board, because different uh, from the traditional power management here. And there's a car located right here. There's a car located right here. And this can uh, press here, the signal transduction down here, you can see the light flash. We try to demonstrate a solve powered system here. We have very many different examples. Due to time limitation, I'll just give you a few, okay? And then you say, well, <clears throat> this sounds good, but total power you have is low. As I begin to say that, today we're looking for distributed small power source. The power of each is small, but the number is huge. So that's the energy for the new era we are facing. That's the Internet of Things, Sense Networks. Then for the future, how possibly can you contribute to the large scope of energy we all need? Let me propose a bigger idea for you. Well, <clears throat> nature offers a lot of power, but we are unable to utilize that. We can only use high quality Power, high quality. If you have this power, this low quality, you cannot use that. In order to do that, people design all kind of infrastructures for housing that, but the efficiency and the cost is tremendously, tremendous. Efficiency low, cost high, and operation environment is very difficult to do that. To do that. So how do you do that? So let me do the comparison. Uh, what's the disadvantage of class technology, they cannot do this. What prepared them to do it? Let me show you, okay? Here it is. We make a magnetic generator, a tropical generator, same volume, different weight, because different mass. So we do the measurements as a function of frequency. <clears throat> Measure the open circuit voltage, short circuit current, both for the electromagnet generator, linear scale with frequency. But for the tropical generator, the current linear silicon with frequency, the voltage is constant, different. You see, this is different here. That's making the difference for the two when you come to the conjunction here. So that means what? For low frequency, this is much more efficient than this one, this one. And how low? Well, a couple hertz. That's what you have in our environment. So we made a device such. You can see this device. We made a disc-shaped trouble generator. At the very beginning, I showed the video. And this is electromagnetic generator. So rotate on one axis, let's see the output. We use this, the output of this, to lit up these three lights. Use the output of this one to lit up these three lights. Let's see which one comes up together first. So when this is rotating, you're gonna see that these three lights, as soon as rotating 80 round per minute, these three lights flashes because driven by this. But the other three lights driven by this one remains unlit because the output low voltage is so low so low. So you have to wait until the rotation speed picks up. Picks up by when? By roughly 350 rounds per minute, 6 hertz. 
Then this slide will start flashing. Then when it's reached about 400 round per minute and it's as bright as the other one. So this, this difference is because at low frequency, these things have literally very little output. Only when the frequency is higher, it picks up. So, but at such a frequency range, we looking for. So all the low quality energy is unable to produce high frequency signals here. And in order to generate power, we have to do things like this, we have to do things like that, but we can't use this, and we cannot use that too. Because too slow. Too slow. So how can we use such power? It's everywhere, it's anywhere. Like, well, let's make a sphere. So we make a sphere generated here, put in the water. And if the water flows here, inside is the core, rotate back the force, rotate back the force. And uh, then you can first one, see how it works, okay? The reason, you see, you put this one in the water, just wobbling of the water, be able to give you. What's the principle? The principle is as simple as this one. We design an uh, asymmetric lateral here. When the ball rotates back, and the force. When the ball hit this side, trouble electricity occurs. The induction on this side occurs too. So this is negative charge induction. This will be positive induction here. In such case, when the ball roll back in the force, the charge flow from one lateral to the other one. Back in the force as rolled. So in the low frequency here, you hear. The advantage of this one is higher voltage output. Even this one can give you hundreds of volts. That means it can be use, useful power. Right, useful power. So in such a case, can we do this? In, and can we be able to utilize the things we are unable to use before? Can we put this in a tank? And can we build a network like this for that? And I have some theoretical calculation shows that if you have a reasonable size, large this one, and it can produce the power just for the world. Theoretical calculation shows that for the size of like a state of Georgia, I live in Georgia, and uh, which have nine million people, that yeah. And then these things, uh, for such a size, and a 10 meter depth of water, if you make a 3D to integrate, the power output is for the world, if you could do that. Well, so this is the dream. So the difference here is quadratic and linear. For low frequency, this beats the other one. So this is a long-term goal, and we are making progress in this one. Can we, for example, can we build such a spheres? Does it work? Well, we build such a things, and it works. It works. And can we make networks here? Can we make it in the, in the ocean like this one? So we're looking for the large scope energy need. Let me do quickly. This can also be sensors. I show you the small power, the big power. It can also be sensor. For example, if you motion sensor, any kind of tricking become electric signal is a sensor. And you can trick different parts and different region here. You have many things here. And this can be utilized here. And Professor uh, uh, Ren Yunzhang did uh, quite a bit of work in this one. And we can make a, a keyboard. When you're typing, we can record where you're typing. The small signal you generate identify your typing patterns. We can put this on a keyboard on here, so you can detect here. So recently, we tried to do that. For example, we make a keyboard that can record the things you're typing, analyze the features you're typing, then if you type another place, we can identify the accuracy, identify who is typing is 98.7%. This is the another one similar like a voice recognition. People do voice recognition uh, 1982. Okay, we talk about uh, th almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago. But today it's getting very popular. This is the typing pattern recognition because they can uh, utilize this one for, for, for different purposes uh, to use a keyboard. So we are developing this one in tangent keyboard. Also for, for uh, tricking and sensing, for medical purposes, for example, this is the tricking. Use the eye motion here, you can trick the switches, can lights on and off. Light on. This is the sensor right here because the sensitivity is about a thousand times higher than in market here, right? So you can see this little turn light flash on. Oh, medical purposes and infrastructure, you can measure the frequency of the bridge, use the vibration bridge to power it, then for, can, for the safety of the infrastructure of here. For medical, we can make a device here, we can measure the, 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 the detailed shape of the heart beating from which we can derive a lot of information about the health conditions as well as blood pressure. Robotics, you can fabricate robotics and the robotic hands is multifunctional, knows the, 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 the 
the, the strength to be put in for hold a cup of water versus comp compare hold a hard ball. For example, different ones use different holding patterns here. So we want to make this one. And also you can make this one for paper made ones. This uses two layer paste, uh, paper made ones here. We can make a double layer, like a 10 micron apart. Sony way triggered, give it a, a electric signal, which can generate that. Utilize this one with the hearing aid. So we can build a hearing aid, use the trouble electric generator here, and they use different frequency, different size, you tune the frequency as well. And you can tune the size of this one to cover the entire frequency range we are interested in. So for example, this is just a, a, a sensor. You can hear that. It's a little sensor here, and it's a, 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 a home security system. So three parts I'm talking about that. Mainly use the trouble electricity for small energy, but it could have a long term for large energy. But also, mostly, it's so power sensors here. It's different from the class technology. This is the conduction current, and this uses the displacement current, and that's a different mechanism, a different path. So therefore, this is a new, new principle, must bring new application. It's not a replace one by the other one. This power, there's no way to replace classical technology. But it can be supplements, because the, we look at the future, is that you be able to, beside the communication introduced by displacement current, which have many things we use today for antenna, like wave, uh, wireless communication, uh, in, uh, 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 lighting, etc. We be able to add a term that can introduce the principle of nano generator for energy, for small energies, for new things we are interested in, for new things we are interested in. Both can be supplement and can be utilized for the future things we are interested in. So those could be the entropy results. This energy dispersed in our environment used to be we are unable to utilize that. We talk about energy conservation. Why we have global warming? We burn everything. Of course we have the warming. No wonder. We burn oil, we burn everything. No wonder. So there's no, no argument is, is warming or not. There's no doubt. Well, how do we stop that? If we keep burning, right, we'll be, we, we'll be, we will be there. So how do we solve this problem is very complicated. I think we can look at some compli complementary ways to solve some of the problems to some extent. So. I'd like to thank all of my team for the hard working. And uh, uh, today, I just used uh, the time to introduce what we can do with this one, and hopefully can contribute a discussion topic for the future of energy sensors, as well as the energy for the Internet of Things, energy for sensor networks, hopefully can bring some discussion for the future. How can we solve the world global problem, global warming problem over the long term? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Wang. I have, to, I have to admit that you almost lost me in the beginning with those difficult calculations. I'm not a scientist myself, but then I started realizing incredible implications of what you're showing here. Let's move over to the questions okay. that we had here. Of course, many of you use the uh, Menti, the code 811031. You can also use that if you're following this on, on, online to post your questions to Professor Wang and to other, other persons later. Let me start with this one. What can we do to fully understand the mechanism of trouble electrification? Very good. We have recently did start this one at the atomic level. How, how does two materials, one physical quantity, the other one charge transferred? So we do various measurements recently, and we have a couple of papers in, in the atomic level to describe how the trouble electricity occurs. Metal with with semiconductor, dielectric with dielectric. So we have several models. If this uh, uh, audience have the interest, send me an email. I will send you those recent publications. So this is a topic I'm studying right now. Hopefully, we can get fully understood in a, in a few years. Thank you. I love that openness so much. And please uh, accept uh, and make good use of, of, of your generous offer. This one is so much in line with the whole conference because we want to bridge science and business. So how do you support entrepreneurs like someone in this room to use nanotechnology for new business applications? Yeah. Nanotechnology is very broad for medical, 
for information technology, for environmental, very many different things. Normally people talk about nanotechnology means nanomaterials, but it's go way beyond nanomaterials. How do you can use a new structure here? So if you have new problem, existing industry problem, we can work with you for new materials to help you to improve the performance. Same time, we can make new structures to make your existing device be powered a different way or sensed a different way. So I think there's a lot of dialogue Discussion be very helpful for the people, industry people to inter interface with us. We we do some invention. Sometimes we don't know where it's useful, and you may have the problem that you don't know the answers to solve your problem. So that's the opportunity we need to talk and discuss. Great. These questions are somehow interlinked, and they're very linked to also what I think is a big challenge for the future: better energy storage. How can you store power from another generation, and how uh, do you measure how efficiently the tank can be stored? Oh, thank you. And this, this we already done this part, but this part is started. You know, this power storage is different from the traditional power storage. Traditional power is a DC input; you continue to charge. Here is a pulse. So it's a new, new problem in the storage. We are attacking that problem right now. So we still use the uh, super capacitors, capacitors for fast storage. And if you have a battery, we can charge that too. So still the classical traditional storage units, but for new mode of storage, because the energy comes as pulses. So this is the storage, and this is how much is the power you can get out of this technology. You say it's small, but can it become big as well? <clears throat> efficiency. People talk efficiency. We measure that. For the low frequency, we can re sometimes achieve about 50% conversion efficiency for energy uh, conversion. For the storage, like power management, we can achieve another 70%. It means 50 multiplied 70, so 30, totally 35% can be stored to the, to the device. I love this question the most. Is it possible to make highways of your technology and allow vehicles to generate <coughs> power? Now, this is linked to, there's a disco in Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands, where part of the disco is actually uh, powered by the, by the feet of people dancing, which is a great thing because then you want energetic uh, music and not, you know, the, sl the slow music. So it's, it's the kind of music I like the most that generates the most power. So how about vehicles and generating powers from that? Yeah, yeah you cannot power the vehicle. Vehicles very, need a lot of power. But the power you generate can be supplement for lighting, for sensors, as well as the, uh, the safety of the automobile. We, I work with a few groups on work on these uh, automations. They work on automation, can monitor the tower, the tire conditions, monitoring the vibration of the cars. Those information feedback the car. The computer system in the car can help to improve the stability and the control of the car. So in that case, it's not to power the car, but make the car much more safer. This I'm not sure whether this question was directly linked to oh. the pacemaker, but I certainly thought about the pacemaker. Do tanks have a lifespan limit or a workload-based uh, wear out? Yeah, that's right. It's always people ask me the durability problem because the material we use like, is, not, is not as durable as we expect to. So we are working on that right now, and we have different modes. Materials issue, we have also design uh, approach to solve that lifetime. And I think this one, hopefully in two or three years, we have some good uh, technology to introduce, to ex expand the lifetime of the device. Professor Wang, I believe you're generous enough to be with us most of the day, is that right? Yeah, I'll be here part of more of the time here. Yes. Great, because yeah. I see that some of these questions are something that People I know that you People are more than welcome to send me emails for the, for the questions and I'm more than happy to answer for them. Thank you so much for your presentation and thank you even more for your gener generous contribution and your openness to continue to interact with us. These are two small tokens of our appreciation. This is a chocolate actually made by students here at the Mitte Universität as a research project. Uh, so here's Swedish chocolate. I'm not, I'm not sure you knew that existed. I was looking for Daniel Jenner inside. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And here we planted, just to make oh. sure that we do a small bit of uh, reducing emissions and improving livelihoods. These are trees planted in Eastern Africa, there's already 12 million before you helped contribute to even more trees there in okay. Eastern Africa. Thanks very much. Professor Wang, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Now, our next speaker is uh, someone who many of us have been using her technology without even realizing because at Wireless Car, Sophia Ganot is the Director for Strategy and Product Management and her technology is used 
to connect more than 2.7 million vehicles globally in more than 65 countries. That's Volvos, that's Mercedes, that's BMWs, that's Audis, that's Nissans, that's Land Rovers, that's Jaguars. I'm not even sure about all the brands. But when you go from the product to the digital, from the physical product to the digital product, there's, there's one expert in the room, and that is you, Sophia. Please welcome up. Give her a warm hand. Listen to the music. Do you recognize the composer? Do you enjoy it? Yes. Actually, it's brand new music and it's composed by a robot. It's Aiva. Um, and Aiva offers music as a service. You just give what you're found of, what um, emotion you want to you know, achieve, and for what purpose, whether it's a commercial or a new movie or just you know, your company team song. And it will de deliver the music to you. So, Aiva, as the new I music composer, try it out. Next one is, you know, if you have an idea and you've been, you know, thinking about writing a book, but you don't have the really ability and you don't want to be refused by a publishing company, now you don't have to. You just click it on, you provide your book directly through Kindle, Amazon's, you know, self-publishing service. You're going to come out to the marketplace and you have the Goodreads is a community with 80 million people. And you get the interaction with your readers without being, you know, forced into going to shopping malls and writing autographs. So now it's really easy to also be a writer without go through publishing. What next? Amazon is dismantling the bank institutions as we know it. Meaning that each and every process in the bank is becoming a new business by itself. You all have heard about new digital banks rising up as Kilarna and Collector. But this is something else. This is what is you know, being tough to copy at the banks as we know it today and becoming something else. So, Every business as we know today is being dismantled, disrupted by its core, and redefined. So the question is, how about your business? And do you know your disruptors? Many companies don't know, actually. What I'm doing as a strategist in um, the huge digital automotive business is to really understanding the macroeconomic perspectives and what you know the tech giants are doing and how the startup companies without you know any money at all are offering new services and competing with the large companies and i'm studying you know why is that happening and how are they doing that you all heard about you know the fang companies facebook um, uh, apple Google, Netflix, Amazon, of course. What are they doing? Well, Facebook is running by feed that you're, you know, with your insights. How you're doing, with whom you're doing what, uh, what event, you know, where you are. So based on that, it's collecting personal insights. Google is doing the same by the search insight you're feeding it with. And of course, location is the foundation of those companies. And this is not so astonishing that smart parking, you know, where to find my parking slot, was invented by Google much, you know, further than the car makers. Because for some years ago, car makers didn't know where I parked my car. They didn't know where I was. Google knew long ago without even having any sensors on the parking slots. So. This is what I'm, you know, looking at, that the information and the insight these companies have about me is widely exceeding what the car makers having. And the idea of having a sort of an inclusive world where shopping, entertaining, um, socializing 
is all on the same platform, much like what Alibaba, Tencent, and Baidu is doing, meaning that everything you spend, everything you're engaging with, everything you're you know, fond of or not fond of, is really the insights that these companies are putting together in order to create just the best product for you. So navigation is not a product they are selling, it is a product to collect that insight. So once you think about a product is free to get the insight versus a product to sell, that you know, specific purpose makes two different designs. If something is for free, then you are the product. That is one sort of service design topic. And if a product has a price tag on it, then you design it you know, differently. So this is what I you know, want you to um, sort of have on your agenda when you're designing different products. Who are you competing with? So what I'm going to take your focus on is that the connected car evolution actually have three different impacts. One is the sustainability, the sustainable smart cities, and they are pushing the boundaries for pollution, congestion, safety, security, and democratic mobility. Democratic mobility means that everyone has access to mobility services. Nevertheless, of the, you know, um, uh, what um, um, class you're belonging to. And the other one is how the automotive connected car landscape as a sense of business is really being dismantled, is being unbounded with new partners, new tech players that are really competing with the old and traditional one. And one other uh, implication is the seamless digital lifestyle, meaning that the car right now is a dead spot for tech giants because I need to have my eyes on the road, yes? So I cannot interact, I cannot be entertained, I cannot shop, I cannot you know, uh, talk with my friends on social media. So right now the car is a dead spot for the tech giants. So what they are doing is of course to eliminate this dead spot. So they are really driving that seamless digital lifestyle perspective in automotive digital services. So what I'm saying is that that is really difficult for automakers to compete with a phone in your pocket. And none of the services in the car appealing to the driver's entertainment and social life will be as good as the tech giant's products. So this is something to think about. So when you're talking about connected car, it's really easy to get dazzled by you know, virtual reality and driver coach and everything in a dashboard that's really appealing. But actually, the main investment right now in the automotive business is put on digitalizing the, um, let's see. Now we would have, you know, the nanotechnology with the battery <laughs> would be good now. The digital car making process behind the scenes is where all the investment is really pushed into. Because you need to manage the car and if the car is, I don't know, later on, being just provided as a service, not by, you know, you sell the car, but you offer it as a service, then you wouldn't need the dealers, would you? And if you're not going to make money and the business model is not based on the parts, which is today, and it's by service instead, then you would need to have a digital sort of a stream between manufacturing, purchasing, the service, and you know, the buyers. So the whole digital flow is a tremendous challenge for all car makers right now to you know, creating just a data flow. We were talking about the energy flow before, and now is data management flow. And you know, in a car making company right now, there are thousands of people working in their silos with purchasing, with engineering, with the, you know, creating the whole um, um, accessories. And now they need to not work with 
their specific IT systems, they need to work with one digital flow. So this is actually what Wireless Car is doing right now. We are connecting the different businesses so the car is an object with all its you know, data identity and the car is moving from factory, from the moment you order it, it goes to the factory, from the factory to the dealer or to the shop or the web shop or to the different car rental companies and from there maybe the car needs to be shareable for car sharing issues then you need to define the car with the list of different users because users is not just a driver. It might be the service guy, the in-car delivery guy, the uh, dealer, the fleet owner. So we need to redefine the car as it's sort of a digital identity. And this is a real huge evolution for the car makers. The investments are huge in this sense. And since wireless car, which is a... Um, 100% um, owned company by AB Volvo, but outside Sweden we are um, famous for being wireless car and not Volvo. Um, we have a global reach. Uh, our business model is to provide managed services for digital services in the automotive. So the business model is based on connected cars. So we have more than 3 million active connected cars for the top car making companies. And if a car has services that is not activated, then our business model is ruined. So our focus is understanding what valuable services can actually be run on the connected car. So the list of the new services, and you might not have the um, latest connected products in your car, and mainly actually most of the services are behind the scenes connecting the car from the factory to the purchasing to the dealer. And the services for the drivers, you know, the smart heater or find the parking or the navigation or book a service. Yeah, we are looking at it. We are promoting it. It's really difficult to get paid for it. And customer, you know, just want it for free. And it's really difficult to compete with the tech giants and all of those services in the pocket, in the phone. So this is a true challenge. But we are working on it. But you know, still, I can't see how the services are addressing the challenges that we are talking about today. Because we are seeing the mega cities rising, yeah? Cities are getting larger and larger. And I know that Hans Rusling have talked about the commonwealth is also increasing, meaning that as soon as middle class families can afford buying a car, they buy a car because it's freedom and is a status symbol at the same time. And that implies that the congestion will increase and also the pollution and the number of fatalities. And you might wonder, my God, aren't we better than that? Don't we have smart cars? Don't we have electric cars? Don't we have smart you know, systems that um, rearrange the traffic flows? Well, we're on it, but it's stuck in the institutions and in research. We don't get it out. So the cars, the electric cars, are a bit too slow to the market. It's, you know, until 2030 that we will see that half of the sales of new cars will be on electric cars. So it's going to take a while. And of course, all cars will be connected, probably shareable, but we don't know about those um, business models. And this is a bit tough to get, you know, through people's mobility um, sort of behavior. Because electric cars, First, the infrastructure is really difficult still. The um, charging is a really hassle. Many companies don't choose it because they can't trust um, the uh, charging perspective. And, you know, it could re really ruin the whole workflow. And, of course, the price tag is not for everyone. It's still quite, you know, expensive. And actually, in Sweden, there is a challenge in um, sort of a different car racing challenge. And the driver who managed to drive the whole loop with as few charging um, occasions as possible will win this. So you need to really be a careful driver. And every year, Tesla is a winner. 
So <laughs> it's going to take a while before electric cars are really matured enough. And even though the governments are making legislation on electric cars, you know, is really a hassle for the car makers because suddenly they need to have three different production lines. One for diesel, one for gasoline, and one for electric cars. Is tripling all the investments. So this is really difficult. And of course, we do have smart cars. And the road to autonomous drive is through advanced driver assistance systems. You know, emergency brake and lane departure warning. All of these um, sort of features are right now implemented in modern car you know, available today. And if you want to have a five-star safe car, these are already legislated according to that. And these features, you will probably, you know, buzz off the lane departure warning because it's nagging, is uh, you know, notifying you. And you probably believe that, hey, let me be. I'm a good driver. And this is exactly the sort of behavior we are addressing today that it's not up to you to decide whether you're a good driver or not. If you're a risky driver, you will probably not be in an accident, but you will cause that someone else is in an accident. So right now, actually, the number of fatalities are actually increasing, even though we do have smarter cars. Because there is a mismatch between smart technology and human factor. And whether human, yeah, human drivers could actually trust all the you know, nice and um, uh, high-tech technology. Right now, there is a distinction between that. So, right now, there are a number of countries who have uh, restricted the usage of smartphone in the cars. <laughs> Still, people are holding the, car, uh, holding the phones in their knees by one hand like a pacifier. That is the <laughs> sort of a misuse usage, and we are sort of abusing smartphones. And the fact that it's so high-tech in the infotainment and dashboard, and people are really focusing on how to get their favorite music or calling someone on interacting, that, you know, it's killing people. People are in more accident right now than 10 years ago, just because of the digital distraction. And I was talking about the dead spot in the car, the entertainment and shopping and socializing. You don't want to have it in the car if you want to drive safe. But the tech giants really are not <laughs> appealing to that thought. So where's the difference here? Also, people being digital native, people much younger than me being in their 20s and 30s, they don't want the hassle of owing a car, going to the service shop, buying a car, um, um, you know, from another, a used car. They just want to have the mobility on demand. So right now, there is a battle between rental car companies, taxi companies, uh, public transportation, and car making companies. Battle in being the mobility provider. Because everyone sees this as a new sort of future business model. And the thing is that the number of um, cars on the street are increasing due to the new, you know, ride hailing business. Uber and app, uh, Uber and Lyft, people take those rides instead of taking the bike or walking or taking the bus. So those new business models are really increasing congestion. Is not complementing the public transportation, is replacing it. We are lazy people. So it's important to understand the impact of what was, you know, a very nice idea of, you know, utilizing most of the car and not having it parked, but it has put some more cars on the street. So if you're talking about autonomous car, it's not going to minimize congestion on the street. And it's not by default an electric car. So let's keep the different initiative in, you know, right um, category. And of course, if you focus all of your sort of effort into the downtown city center, you will probably forget about the elderly people living in, you know, out of um, um, city kernel, um, and the young people have moved into town. 
And the elderly people without any transportation, because public transportation is not there, taxi companies are, you know, shut down many years ago. And what do you, you know, who served the mobility for everyone? I read a research about the city of Melbourne where public transportation, 80% of public transportation effort is focused on city centre serving 30% of people. The one who are rich enough to have a car but they don't, the one who are rich enough to live in city centre. The other 70% outside the centre only get 20% of the public transportation effort. Somewhere in there we go wrong. So mobility as such requires a sort of a holistic view. And of course, I need some nanotechnology. There. <laughs> My kids, they are, you know, envisioning a nice, whoa! Let's go here. All right. The difference between a you know nasty city and a nice city. You see, my kids they uh, want you know cars somewhere out of the city, and they want spacious places with green area and a place to be active in. And of course, if you envision the um, um, Gothenburg 2070, there is actually a vision um, report about it. You see that. Transportation from other cities go just outside the city. We don't have all the cars into the city. And in the middle of city center, there are small, soft and gentle and autonomous pods moving around. And they are on demand without any timetables and people are really free to do whatever they want. So this is the city vision. And I don't see any traditional car. Do you? So. By all means, the autonomous cars that we envision is not 500 kilo, is not you know, the mean machine that you can drive however you want. It's something else. So, regarding to this vision, it's easy to understand that mobility as a service is something that we are focusing on right now, because we do believe that there is need for a holistic view in that sense. Where do people want to go? What is the best way to do it? Time, efficiency, cost, experience. So it's not so difficult to understand that actually tech giants, car making companies, service companies, car rental companies are all focusing in how to make you know, um, mobility as a service function. But the thing is that if you want to provide the best service of mobility, then you're probably not a car maker. A car maker has a business model focused on selling more cars. So if you're at the same time a mobility provider, then you want to optimize your business model on selling cars. You see the distinction here? And if you're just a fleet owner of many cars, then you would like to optimize the utilization of the cars. So if you're gonna be mobility provider, then you will focus on getting that business model ahead. So, depending on what kind of business model you want to optimize, you design the mobility service, you know, depending on that. This is why we need to be really clear with our purpose. So, if Google is providing a navigation service for you, but the business model is selling ads, then you would actually understand that, all right, point of interest in the navigation will be optimized for selling ads. If you, you know, get something for free, then you are the product. If the mobility provider is a car making company, then they want to sell more cars or provide more cars. So we need to have different sort of entrepreneurs, different sort of business models serving the mobility provider as such. And there is not going to be a government in charge for this, because governments are not companies. They, are, they aren't run by those kind of models. So what you want to do is to 
not only providing mobility as service because we are lazy, <laughs> convenient people and we buy a house somewhere where we could afford it and we want to go to work to somewhere else where is a you know, nice salary and fun work to do and the distance could be you know, two hours commuting. So you get to understand why people live where they, where they do and what job they select and how come the activities nearby their house is not sufficient enough? Why do we move? I know it's a human right, but why do we commute? Why do we, you know, put our children to the school and we drive them, you know, for one and a half kilometer every day? They could take a bike. Ah, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. We need to understand why people move. Because otherwise, mobility, mobility provider as a service will just be a bandage. It's not going to, you know, address the root cause as is such. And right now, actually, there, is, there are some uh, very exciting um, research projects ongoing. One of those are the um, Sidewalk Lab, together with City of Toronto. Sidewalk Lab is an Alphabet-owned company, the uh, Google mothership. Um, they are turning one of the suburbia in Toronto to a yeah, digital city. So they are addressing, you know, where people live, where do they work, how come they, you know, commute, in what senses. And they are building a sort of a digital infrastructure of not just mobility, but also where the jobs are and where people want to live and how to, you know, plan the different social activities. And City of Toronto won't, you know, drive that kind of system. It's going to be probably sidewalk labs. I really like the idea of getting the city digital. I'm not so keen of Google running the city, but probably this will, you know, create a sort of a recipe, a sort of a template for how to, you know, bring it out. Still, this is a new city. It's really difficult to make it work on old cities, but I like the holistic perspective of why do you commute? Why do you take your car everywhere? Is it because safety or time or experience or, you know, being on your own and being in a tranquil moment? Why do you move? And I can't really see any institution or research or car makers or anyone else addressing that issue. So right now the battle is to um, sort of providing mobility as a service, not only producing cars. So car maker companies, car rental companies, dealers, they are all providing car sharing as a concept right now. Because they want to understand, they want to understand the whole disruption of owing a car, how does it work? And whether people, you know, are going to take a subscription of a car much easier by the phone instead of, you know, visiting a car shop and probably they won't do it if they need to buy a car, which is the second most, you know, largest uh, investment you do in your life. And subscription is much easier to do by phone. So this is where it's going. Still is a mini tiny business model to, you know, take a look at it. So, uh, there. And understanding the business of automotive car making and the whole hard to copy business is to design a car, manufacture it and provide it to those who want to buy it for, you know, last 30 or 40 years ago. And now suddenly they need to produce it as a service, ride hailing or car sharing or subscription. This is really revolutionizing everything that car makers are all about. They don't work that way. They don't have the digital data flow. They can't offer service, software as a service, car as a service. This is really turning the car maker companies upside down. And each and every business, ride hailing or car as a service is tremendously different. So the amount of software these companies need is ridiculously massive. And the complexity is huge. And you need to bring in new people who are, you know, software skilled people, not mechanical engineers. So this is why it's really difficult to turn from product making to be a 
service companies. And this is what I've done for the last 15 years with small luck. So <laughs> it's always someone who is afraid for data and digital services. So I'm not succeeding in that. We need to butter it up. <laughs> so conclusions. Um, what I see is that enjoyable and entertaining and seamless digital lifestyle is um, really being drive, driven by tech giants, where the money is. And that evolution is ridiculously fast. But the implications of minimizing pollution, congestion, safety and security is done just by legislation. There is no money in that business. And I just, you know, a fantasy would be that car maker companies go together with health insurance companies to minimize pollution. Because that would really make an effort in the um, insurance investment. And in that case, you would really see some effort in minimizing pollution. Because you would earn money. In legislation, you don't earn any money. It's just, you know, punishment. So this is why evolution that is driven by entrepreneurship and business, when you see obvious you know, earnings compared to goals that are driven just by legislation, you know, the evolution is like this. Not much is going to happen here. And it's going to take a while before people's decision making or you know, being a best citizen will actually make an effort here. So, in order to drive those kind of possibilities, make money out of pollution, then you need to have digital marketplaces for insurance companies, for service entrepreneurs, for healthcare companies, together with automakers. And then suddenly you will see astonishing stuff. So data management is the shit. Get your <laughs> services together and really understand what as a service means because that's going to be your new capability. So uh, get the creativity done. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Sophia. I felt like this was like an extended TED talk. It was just brilliant <laughs> to listen to you. Thank you. And I'm also impressed by your openness because many of, many of the people you work with are the car industry, but mm. still you sort of open the lid to what's really happening mm. in the car industry. Now let's move over. Well, to actually, some I happen to be both um, from Iran and middle age and uh, not afraid. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be, um, yeah, daring. Just go for it. So some of these questions I believe that we might already have touched upon, but we see that, uh, for instance, there's several questions about that, that a lot of us, uh, at least some of us in here, actually like driving a car. We do it because it's fun to drive, not as a transport purpose. We, do, we have cars because it's a status symbol. So all that you've been saying, how does that relate to these kind of feelings about vehicles? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, go to the racing wreck. And if driving a car is entertainment, you need to do it in safe places. You can't mix, I mean, my God, how fun is commuting to work, getting stuck in traffic is not that fun. So if you want to, you know, be entertained by your car, you probably are going to do that in, you know, a, a nice countryside because those places are not where we have the most problems. So you're going to take your car, into the city center, park it, and then go with the pods inside the city. So it's not yes and no. We're going to have multiple different mobility services. And that is where we need to you know, think again. Don't be so selfish. <laughs> Somebody raised the question about safety concerns. I think many of us saw, I think it was a year ago, when a, when a Jeep was, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, hijacked. And mm -hmm. I would be worried about that call. Your car is not going to turn at the next corner unless you quickly pay 10,000 euros or mm -hmm. something like that. How do you see the connected connectivity and safety? Actually, during last year, it was 7 million uh, cybersecurity attack all over the world. But you know what? These are still the corner cases. Because the possibility or the risk of, you know, being unsafe in the car is, uh, you know, getting minimized by the uh, artificial intelligence and the way we are getting better in cybersecurity. So that is the least to be worried about. 
So that's the least to be worried about. How about this one? Big Brother is watching what happens with all the data generated. I hate the idea as well. Read the loss, the number of um, the magazine filter, and you read about the centralized internet where actually no one can offer products that are free and you are the product, but everyone could interact with providing you a, you know, a token for the data you're sharing. And that's really appealing to me because I don't like this. I don't like the idea that the business models are hidden and I don't know, you know who is wanting you know, know what from me and what's the price. So um, that could actually be watched within the autonomous business. It could be. And you're certainly doing a great job in exposing the business models of the different entities. So that's, that's great to hear and great to start thinking about. Somebody asked here, with the 5G when it enters our lives, would the cars themselves be the mobile internet providers? Actually, today are um, a lot of different discussion, just a very short um, insight. The um, autonomous car don't need to have connectivity because all the intelligence is already in the car. But as soon as the car needs to work with everything else around it, you know, with other cars or understanding in five kilometers is ice on the road and there is a traffic jam, then, then of course you need to have some kind of communication. But there is a discussion regarding DSRC, short range communication, uh, Wi-Fi hotspot and several different uh, sort of communication connectivity perspective. But as 5G um, sort of uh, pods, that's quite expensive. And, and speaking, the business and model is expensive. really not there yet. Speaking of expensive, this is also linked to expensive. Will this increase the divide between the global rich and poor who will not have access to this technology? Mm -hmm. This is what I'm really you know, uh, aching about because many of the services right now on the digital um, automotive business are um, provided to the premium seg segment. And that really doesn't work for digital services because digital services need to be mass used. The more they are used, the better they get and the more insight you get. And right now, most of, the do of those services are just on the premium side. But car as a service will be down to the sort of a middle class car um, uh, brands. But it will still be linked to new cars only. I used to live in Kenya and you, you're from, also from a different country where second-hand cars are mm -hmm. the norm. You need to forget about it because also second-hand cars will be in that loop right. in the car sharing. So don't buy a car, take it as a service, but it's not really there yet. It's a bit uh, hacking the system, but within the next five years it's going to be affordable. Last and potentially most critical question to you, are you helping the car industry to survive when it's really time for new solutions? Um, probably we are, but I mean, we won't be in the business if not car sharing and utilization of car as a sort of a tool wouldn't be there. So my hope and envision is that I'm going to make car sharing and uh, car as a service in those perspective for the smart city a reality. I'm hoping to do a good job because I'm, you know, I'm not working for one car maker. Sophia, we learned a lot. Are you staying throughout the day? Uh, most of the day. Most of the day because a few of these questions we didn't have time to go through. So you know what Sophia looks like now. Please <laughs> approach her with your questions. Sophia, here's a few ah. trees in Africa for you. Here's some locally produced chocolate. And Thank please you. give Sophia another warm hand. Thanks for listening. Right after the break, in now 18 minutes and 22 seconds, we're going to have Nyamko Sabuni with us. Please enjoy uh, the brief break just outside. Be back at 11.30. Thank you.
Welcome back for the final session before lunch. Those of you still not seated, please find some great seats and let me tell you that just as a regular cinema, there's no extra pricing. It's not more expensive to sit in the very front. These seats all cost the same, so if you want to approach, feel free to do so. Let me also remind every one of you that this is sent live on the website of the scienceandinnovationday.com if you want to uh, spread the message to friends and colleagues who could not be here, and, and please share your wise words of wisdom with the hashtag SID. Science and Innovation Day 2018 on Twitter and other social media of your preference. And remember to use the menti.com. It doesn't cost anything. There's no app to download. And use this code to put the questions to the speakers. We had some great questions, but also a lot of us didn't pose any as yet. You still have the chance to do so. Now, the next speaker, I was specifically told not to mention that she's a previous minister of the Swedish government. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Ms. Nyamko Sabuni, she is now the Executive Vice President of OF Consulting, OF in Swedish or OF Consulting in English, and the Head of Sustainability. And she's going to help us understand how to transform the business models to better incorporate sustainability. Please give Nyamko a warm hand. <laughs> and whilst... Good seeing you. And whilst, Thank let me just also explain that this is going to be a great bilingual exercise because Nyamko is going to be speaking in Swedish, but your slides are going to be in English. So it's great exercise for all of us. Yes. Någon som har en granne som inte förstår så snälla hjälp till att förklara vad jag pratar om. Det är fantastiskt att få komma och tala efter både professor Wang och Sofia som har berättat så väldigt mycket ingående om just det som vi försöker jobba med för att skapa hållbar framtid. Vi är ju teknikkonsulter, design- och teknikkonsulter. 10 000 medarbetare finns i 30 länder och utför projekt i över 100 länder. Både liksom infrastrukturprojekt hjälper alla industrier av olika slag. Vi har digitaliseringsdivision och inte minst energidivisionen som vi jobbar med. Så vi finns väldigt brett och överallt. Och jag ska, när vi har föreläsen, komma in lite på och återkoppla lite hela tiden till det Wang och Sofia pratade om. Men innan vi går in på hur OF jobbar och lägger upp de här frågorna så vill jag ändå berätta om den fantastiska resan som hållbarhetsarbetet har genomgått. När jag var ung vuxen i början på 90-talet och kom in i arbetslivet så var företagens hållbarhetsarbete i princip bara om sponsring. Man sponsrade lokala aktiviteter av olika slag. Det var ungdomsverksamhet, verksamhet som vände sig till invandrare eller till kvinnor. Och en del företag med internationell verksamhet kunde sponsra bygge av skolor eller vårdcentraler, vårdcentraler i utvecklingsländer. Inte alltid kunde man se länken mellan det man sponsrade och den affär man faktiskt bedrev. Sen i slutet på 90-talet så kom vi till nästa era som var det här med som jag kallar compliance. Det vill säga att företagen nu måste hitta sätt och rutiner för att bedriva sina affärer på ett ansvarsfullt sätt. 99 så introducerade Kofi Annan det man kallar för UN Global Compact. Och det var början för världens länder att börja ifrågasätta att vi har multinationella företag med omsättningar ibland större än vissa länder i världen men som inte åläggs att ha ansvar för en hållbar utveckling inte åläggs ansvar för att bygga välfärdssamhällen runt om i världen där de är det vill säga inte skatteplanerat till exempel. Så UN Global Compact blev de här tio principerna som företagen skulle följa med respekt för mänskliga rättigheter, arbetares rättigheter, att påverka miljö så lite som möjligt och framför allt att motverka korruption i, på, på, på marknaden. Nu har vi kommit till den tredje eran som jag kallar för innovationseran. Och det är nu fantastiska saker börjar hända. Det är nu det som Sofia berättade om eller det som professor Wang var inne på när det gäller liksom, vart är vi på väg? Vi kan inte fortsätta elda på kol, vi kan inte fortsätta använda olja. Hur ska vi se, hur ska vi lösa framtidens energibehov 
utifrån de problem vi ser idag. Det är här som företagen börjar förstå att hållbarhet måste vara en naturlig del av affären. Att hållbarhet innebär lönsamhet och inte kostnad. Men det är klart att så länge man befann sig på de här två första eror, det vill säga då att sponsra eller att bara följa etiska riktlinjer så blir det en kostnad. Men så fort man gör hållbarhet också till en innovationsfråga då blir det en lönsamhetsfråga. Och vi är på väg att lämna det här att göra så lite dåligt som möjligt till att faktiskt börja göra gott för samhället. Det är där vi befinner oss idag. Men för att förstå vad vi behöver göra tillsammans så måste vi också förstå var vi kommer ifrån. Vad har hänt senaste 70-100 åren? Hur har utvecklingen sett ut? Tidigare talare var också inne på det. Hans Rosling har försökt beskriva denna bild för oss som många av oss är blinda för. Vi ser gärna problem men inte den utvecklingen, den positiva utveckling vi faktiskt nått senaste åren. Det vi pressar tillbaka fattigdomen, det vi botar sjukdomar och lever längre. Det är fler människor går i skolan, också flickor och pojkar går i skolan i lika stor utsträckning. Det händer massa, massor med bra saker i världen som vi idag inte ser. Vi lever i flera demokratier idag än tidigare. Men välfärden och livsstilen som vi har har ju också skapat problem, utmaningar som vi nu måste lösa. Den första utmaningen har vi ju varit inne på, global uppvärmning. Om vi fortsätter att producera, om vi fortsätter att konsumera och leva som vi har gjort de senaste hundra åren så kommer vi riskera temperaturhöjningar på över två grader jämfört med förindustriell tid. Vilket alla experter säger, det tål inte mänskligheten. Så vi måste vi ta åtgärder för att dämpa våra utsläpp och därmed också dämpa global uppvärmning. Och här handlar det självklart väldigt mycket om framtidens energilösningar. Jag är väldigt glad att få höra att den blåa energikällan är kanske mycket viktigare än den gröna. För att den gröna källan som vi har, den behöver användas till väldigt många andra saker. Så vi kan inte använda den bara till energi när vi vet att det finns problem också inom textilvärlden till exempel och branscher och så vidare där skogen måste användas till annat. Men att kunna använda vatten är ju en bra sak. Men det kommer inte att räcka. Här kommer vi också se väldigt mycket forskning som pågår kring solenergi, möjligheten att fånga energi och kunna använda den när också solen inte är framme. Visste ni att om man lyckades fånga solenergi under en minut och lagra den så skulle den mängden energi räcka till hela världens befolkning under ett helt år. Det här innebär att vi har en stor kraftkälla för energi som idag inte nyttjas på bästa sätt. Och det behövs bara investeringar och tekniska lösningar för att det ska bli möjligt för framtiden. Och därmed behöver vi inte oroa oss för utsläppen. Den andra utmaningen handlar då om växande befolkning och växande medelklass. Som jag sa, vi pressar tillbaka fattigdomen, fler och fler tillhör medelklass. Vi är idag ungefär 3 miljarder människor som tillhör den så kallade medelklassen. Vi finns i Europa, i USA, Australien och så vidare. Men det håller på att växa fram en ny medelklass i Asien, Afrika och Latinamerika. Och när vi redan idag börjar ifrågasätta vår konsumtion. Vi har konsumtionsmönstren som ställer till problem. Kommer resurser att räcka för kommande generationer för att tillfredsställa sina behov på samma sätt som vi kan idag? Så är svaret nej, inte om vi fortsätter att använda resurser på det sätt som vi gör idag. Och dessa tre miljarder nya som tillkommer till medelklassen, de kommer precis som Sofia, så de kommer fortsätta att konsumera. De kommer vilja ha egen bil, de kommer konsumera telefoner, vitvaror, kläder, skor och allt det där. Därför att det är status. Och utmaningen blir här, hur ska då de som tillverkar och säljer de här produkterna bidrar till ett skifte i sina affärsmodeller. Att helt enkelt gå från där att äga saker till delningsekonomi, att gå från linjär ekonomi till cirkulär ekonomi där vi återanvänder, återvinner det material som vi faktiskt tar upp ur jordskorpan och så vidare. Här sker väldigt mycket skifte i affärsmodeller. Och det företag som inte förstår det som pågår just nu, det kommer förmodligen inte kunna finnas kvar på marknader. Det gäller att hela tiden ligga i framkant. 
Den tredje utmaningen handlar om en växande städer där det fler och fler människor vill bo. Och det här är en fördel på alla sätt och vis. Ju fler vi kan bo på mindre yta, desto mer innovativa kan vi vara. Men framförallt, innovationer blir så mycket mer effektiva för de når så många människor så snabbt. Men det är också en utmaning. Våra städer är ju inte byggda med människans liksom, specifika behov för att vara välmående i centrum. Det är ju byggt utifrån mobilitetsbehoven där bilen har kommit att symbolisera det som faktiskt ska tas fram från en punkt till en annan. Och där har det inte hänt så väldigt mycket så kallade disruptiva innovationer på det området. Det hände när Henry Ford erbjöd gjorde bilen till varmans sak istället för häst och vagn. Men sen efter det har det inte hänt så väldigt mycket. Vi jobbar för självkörande bilar, eldrivna bilar, förhoppningsvis på ren el. Det är utveckling, det är innovation, men det är ingen disruptiv innovation. Jag tror den disruptiva innovationen när det gäller mobilitetslösningar har vi inte sett ännu. Det här duger till 2030, men vad händer efter 2030? Då tror jag mer på den bilden som Sofia visade som hennes barn ritat. Det är inga bilar fanns i staden när de befann sig. Och vad det handlar om det är att Planeringen av städer kommer utgå från människans behov och då är frågan hur använder vi oss av den minst tredjedelen av våra städer som består av vägar och parkeringsplatser som upptas av bilar. Hur använder vi oss av den delen? Förstår ni hur stora värden som finns i de utrymmen om man nu vill odla, om man vill ha grönområden, rekreationsområden, vad man nu vill. Men det ska vara ren luft och det ska vara tyst när det gäller buller och så vidare. Och allt detta kan vi inte få så länge bilen är centrum i hur vi planerar våra städer. Så våra städer har inte heller utvecklats de senaste hundra åren och ser ungefär likadana ut. Men den dagen vi hittar, vi planerar staden efter människan kommer vi också behöva hitta nya sätt att förflytta oss. Då är det här med kör delningsekonomin när det gäller bilar det kommer vara bra till 2030, men i framtiden så tror jag att vi rör på oss på helt annorlunda sätt. Det där är den, de utmaningar, bland många andra säkert, men de stora globala trender som företag, politiker och så vidare, tjänstemän, försöker förhålla sig till och se vad är det framtiden kräver. Och det är klart att det här lär oss att de här frågorna är komplexa och vi måste se holistiskt på det när vi angriper de här problemen. Och vi behöver en gemensam karta vart vi är på väg. Och den kartan introducerades 2015 av FN. I det här fallet inte bara av de politiska ledare utan också av ledare i näringslivet som var med och tog fram den kartan som de enar i det vi ska arbeta utifrån, det man kallar för Agenda 2030 i Sverige. Låt mig läsa historien. Imagine a world where there is no poverty and zero hunger. We have good health and well-being, quality education and full gender equality everywhere. There is clean water and sanitation for everyone. Affordable and clean energy has helped to create decent work and economic growth. Our prosperity is fueled by investments in industry, innovation and infrastructure and that has helped us to reduce inequalities. We live in sustainable cities and communities and responsible consumption and production is healing our planet. Climate action has capped the warming of the planet and we have flourishing life below water and abundant diverse life on land. We enjoy peace and justice through strong institutions and we have built long term partnerships for the goals. Har ni hört den historien, den visionen om vart vi är på väg? Ni kände till den, ni känner i alla fall igen kartan. Det här är en historia som vi förväntas dela. Oavsett vad vi är, vad vi är verksamma, om det är offentliga eller privata, om vi är en organisation eller enskilda medborgare så förväntas vi agera utifrån vad de här målen faktiskt vill att vi ska nå för mål till 2030. Och här är det viktigt att man fokuserar där man gör störst skillnad. Det blir ju lätt så när man jobbar som hållbarhetschef så vill ju alla att man ska tycka att allt är viktigt. Allt är viktigt, men OF kan inte lösa allt. OF måste ha eget fokus på det som är viktigast, precis som varje företag och organisation 
och politiker för den delen måste se vilket är det de behöver bidra mest till för att göra skillnad. Därför att vad vi gör på ett eller ett par mål bidrar också till de andra målen. Allting är sammanlänkat. Precis som vad vi gör här påverkar minoriteter i Amazonas. Och vad de gör där påverkar oss. Men också att vi fokuserar på ett mål inser vi snart påverkar också de andra målen. Så i ert hållbarhetsarbete fokusera där ni vet att ni gör mest skillnad. Många företag har ju som sagt, när jag visar den här hållbarhetsresan och många företag har ju länge, eller håller på fortfarande kanske majoriteten, har två olika strategier. Först har man en strategi för affären, det viktiga, där pengarna kommer in. Och sen har man en strategi för hållbarhet. Någonting vid sidan av, man tar bara upp någon som får ansvara för det där. Som inte har gehör, har gehör i organisationen, vad är det vi behöver göra för att vara en hållbar verksamhet? Och man behöver mer och mer se till att hållbarhetsstrategi och affärsstrategi blir ett. För det är då man ser de här innovationerna som är viktiga. Och det är det som vi nu har gjort med vår egen strategi. För ett år sedan så tog vi fram en ny affärsstrategi. Vi bytte vd, fick en ny chef. Och kan börja med att ta fram en egen ny affärsstrategi tillsammans med oss andra. Och den bygger på de här fyra benen som ni kan se. Vi ska expandera internationellt. Och det är viktigt. Utmaningar finns överallt. Vi förvärvar, vi anställer, vi blir större. Och vi ser att marknaden är större än Sverige och Norden. Men vi vill också leverera ännu högre och större värden till våra kunder och då inser vi det att då måste vi komma upp högre upp i värdekedjan för att kunna leverera dessa hållbara råd och lösningar till våra kunder på de utmaningar som vi ser framför oss att de har. Och vi ska bedriva våra verksamheter på ett ansvarsfullt sätt och vi ska vara en attraktiv arbetsgivare. Så här ser vår affärsstrategi ut. Det här är det vi följer upp och mäter när det gäller hållbar verksamhet. Det går hand i hand. Det är inte två olika strategier. Det är precis samma strategi. Medarbetare är den viktigaste delen av årets verksamhet. Och ska vi fortsätta behålla dem som är bra och ta in intressera andra på marknaden och komma till OF, då måste vi jobba med att se till att medarbetare trivs, känner att de får vara med om spännande projekt och att allas potential används på bästa sätt. Att verksamheten och företaget präglas av jämställdhet, mångfald och inkludering. Men också att vi gör affärer på ett schysst sätt. Att vi inte åtar oss att göra vad som helst. Vi har rutiner där vi går in och tittar. Vad är det för projekt vi ska åta oss? Vad är det för kund? Vad är det för bransch? Finns det risker för att mänskliga rättigheter kan kränkas? Finns det risker för korruption eller finns det risker att miljön påverkas och förstörs mer än det behöver påverkas? När vi ser alla dessa utmaningar så ställer det krav på vår reaktion på det hela. Många gånger kan vi agera själva. När det gäller korruptionsfråga då agerar vi internt. Bara se till att de involverade får utbildning. Vad säger lagen? Vad har du för skyldighet som arbetstagare? Men när det gäller miljöfrågor, då hamnar vi i den här relationen till kunden. För det är oftast kundens verksamhet som påverkar miljön, inte våra tjänster. Och då är det viktigt att man är ärlig med sig själv. Gör kunden rätt när den vill ha den här lösningen. Gör, den, gör kunden rätt hur den bedriver sin affär generellt sett. Vi har hoppat av projekt där miljöpåverkan har varit för stor och vi inte kan stå för det. Gruveverksamhet där man tömmer avfall i floden i närheten av gruvan. Och det kunde vill att vi ska bygga säkra vägar in och ut i gruvan, vilket är en jätte, väldigt bra uppdrag, skapa många hållbara värden. Att inte skadas eller dö på sin arbetsplats är en viktig hållbarhetsfråga. Men när vi gör då den här riskbedömningen för att se vad är det för projekt, vad är det för kunde, vad är det för område i världen vi är på väg till, så hittar vi att kunden just tömmer det här avfallet på ett olämpligt sätt. Då går vi tillbaka till kunden och frågar om inte den ska låta oss hitta en lösning hur de kan då hantera sitt avfall för att inte påverka den miljö för de människor som bor runt omkring den här gruvan. Kunden var inte intresserad av en annan lösning. Och det är då vi säger nej till att jobba med den här kunden. 
När vi gör de här riskbedömningarna så är inte vår tanke att vi ska hitta kunder vi inte vill jobba med. Vi är ingenjörer och designers. Vår uppgift är att göra världen lite bättre för varje dag, för varje projekt. Så vi hittar inte projekt vi säger nej till. Vi vill hitta projekt eller brister som vi kan åtgärda eller vi tillsammans med kunden kan åtgärda. Och när kunden inte är intresserad, vilket inte sker speciellt ofta längre idag, men då måste vi backa ur. Vi har backat ur vattenkravsprojekt och vi har backat ur ett projekt också här i Norden, i ett grannland. För vi sa att man behöver hitta en annan lösning på de problem som de orsakar. Så det här är väldigt viktigt att göra till en viktig del av affären. Jag sa det att hållbarhet är en lönsamhetsfråga. Ja, och hållbarhet driver vår affär. Vi har ju sett de här globala trender. Vad är det för utmaningar våra kunder har framför sig? Och därmed kan vi omvandla det till vilka är våra drivkrafter för att förbli lönsamma och hållbara för framtiden? Då ser vi de här områden. Det ställs krav och frågor på att man ska bygga hållbara städer. Vad innebär det? Då måste man kunna förklara det. Det är väl så att vi kanske inte kommer leverera en hållbar stad fullt ut. Utan vad, det, vad som händer är att kunderna hela tiden bit för bit försöker utveckla sina städer. Bit för bit vi tar nya åtgärder. Idag får man kanske inte köra bilar på vissa gator i stan. Imorgon har vi de här dieselfria zoner och i övermorgon är det någonting annat. Men... Till slut så kommer det verkligen handla om, är det bilen som ska köra oss eller rör vi på oss på ett annat sätt? Vilka är framtidens mobilitetslösningar? Effektivisera industrin. Jag pratar just om när reuse, reduce, recycle och så vidare. Cirkulär ekonomisk tänk för framtiden. Det är också någonting vi ser att vi kan och behöver göra. Inte minst att använda sig av all den information som finns idag, big data, är ju viktigt inte minst för industrierna men också för samhället. Framtidens mobilitetslösningar, men också då det framtida energilandskapet. Det är där vi ser att vi kommer vara starkast och våra kompetenser kommer att behövas. Därför blir hållbarhet en naturlig del och lönsam del av OF. Om vi skulle nå målen 2030 kring bara de här fyra sektorer så skulle det frigöras stora värden som ni ser. Skulle det frigöras 12 biljoner dollar per år kring de här fyra, bara de här fyra områden till 2030. Och det skulle innebära att vi skapar 380 miljoner jobb i världen. Så vi talar också om att effektivisering, robotisering och så vidare kommer innebära att människor inte behöver att komma och jobb. Men det handlar inte alls om det, det handlar bara om att jobben kommer att se annorlunda ut. Utbildningen måste anpassas till den framtid som vi är på väg till. Det kommer alltid att behövas järnkraft, kroppskraft och så vidare för att utveckla världen framåt. Vad skulle det krävas för att bygga en hållbar stad om någon kommer och beställde en hållbar stad? Jag sa att vi är 10 000 medarbetare med olika kompetenser. Alla är inte ingenjörer även om majoriteten är ingenjörer. Men tillsammans skulle vi faktiskt kunna leverera en hållbar stad, om någon beställde det. Och när vi inte själva har den kompetensen så skulle vi kunna se till att vi får partnerskap med någon som kan åstadkomma det. Den här frågan om till exempel citizen and democracy. Det är klart vi kan bidra till den också, men det är framför allt våra politiker, välfärdssamhälle med utbildningssystem som bidrar till att se till att vi får välinformerade, välutbildade medborgare som är ansvarsfulla. Men allt annat, mycket annat, kan vi klara själva. Eller i partnerskap med övrigt näringsliv. För att veta vad man gör och vad man bidrar till så är det väldigt viktigt att också mäta sitt arbete. Och vi har försökt mäta vår hållbarhetsprestanda. När jag var ny hållbarhetschef på OF så var en sak som hela tiden pockade på var hur visar jag att mitt arbete gör nytta överhuvudtaget? Och många gånger vill man ju säga att jag gör en ekonomisk nytta. Jag tror inte jag behöver göra det längre nu när vi har sett till att affärsstrategin är samma som hållbarhetsstrategi. Där ser man de här ekonomiska nyttor. Men man kan också mäta på annat sätt. Gör jag nytta och ser till att vi blir bättre när det gäller hållbarhetsprestanda för vår verksamhet? Och jag slog mig i lag med RISE, 
som då hade ett svar och sa att vi har varit med på ett EU-projekt där EU forskningsinstitut samlat ihop forskare från olika discipliner och det frågan var kan man mäta smärta, kan man mäta komfort, kan man mäta olika typer av saker som man känner som man inte kan kvantifiera men man känner hur mäter man det och en av frågan var hur mäter man hållbarhet och där var RISE representerad i den delen som skulle ta fram ett sätt att mäta hållbarhetsprestanda och deras modell blev jag så intresserad av så vi bad att få importera den till OF som är självklart mycket mycket större än den delen av RISE som hjälpte oss med det här eller som hade startat det här och nu har vi en modell av ett IT-redskap där vi kan mäta vår prestanda både ur kvalitetssynpunkt och kvantitet beroende på vad det är vi vill mäta och det här gör vi på ett vetenskapligt sätt där det kommer ut ett värde mellan noll och hundra. Och det viktigaste med det här är att hundra kommer vi ju aldrig nå. Det kommer inget företag att nå. Att jobba med hållbarhet är ungefär som att jobba med demokrati. Ständigt pågående arbete, ständigt pågående förnyelse. Men man ska hela tiden eftersträva och vara sitt bästa jag. Det är det det handlar om. Och när jag ställer frågor då till mina medarbetare. Vi följer upp nu på 60-tal punkter som vi har identifierat som viktiga för vår verksamhet för att den ska vara hållbar. Det sägs att det finns ungefär 2500 sådana där punkter. Så varje företag får ju då se vilka är viktiga och vilka har bärkraft för vår verksamhet. Och vi har identifierat 60-tal punkter som vi följer upp på. När jag ställer frågor till mina medarbetare hur bra tror ni att OF är som verksamhet när det gäller hållbarhet mellan 0 och 100. Är det någon som vet vad de svarar? Hur bra vi är? 0 och 100, kan någon bara gissa något? Om ni skulle gissa, hur bra tror ni att vi är? 71. 71. Mm. Ungefär där skulle jag också säga att de brukar ligga. 75, 80, sådär. Och det här beror ju på att de har ju sett ett antal kopior som vi har sagt att det här är prioriterade kopior. Och det är de kopiorna vi, liksom, vi tar åtgärder kring, investera pengar i och se till att alla levererar så att vi ska bli ännu bättre. För det är det vår hållbarhetsrapport har innehållit. Men nu när vi börjar mäta vår prestanda, det vill säga helheten, då ser faktiskt bilden annorlunda ut. Första mäteåret så fick vi 59. Andra året har vi fått 63. Och det viktigaste är att vi hela tiden ska kunna se progress framåt. Och det viktigaste är att vara transparent, inte ljuga för sig själv, använda det här som ledningssystem i sitt arbete. För nu ser alla vilken av de här 60 lådorna kan jag bidra till. Hur gör jag det? Det blir så transparent. Vem äger faktiskt funktionen för att kunna vidta åtgärder för att kunna bidra till en utvecklad hållbarhetsprestanda. Det är transparent nu. Alla ser. Alla förstår helt plötsligt att hållbarhet skapas inte på hållbarhetsavdelningen. Vi kan injicera idéer. Vi samlar in vad som händer. Vi rapporterar på det. Vi kommunicerar. Men vi skapar inte hållbarhet på vår avdelning. Det görs i verksamheten. Och det här tycker jag är ett viktigt redskap som jag hoppas fler företag vill använda sig av för att mäta sin hållbarhetsprestanda. Och oavsett vilka förut, typ av företag man är så går faktiskt att jämföra sig med varandra. Om vi inom tjänsteföretaget jämför vår prestanda vad som blir efter vi har valt ett antal parametrar som vi menar är viktiga så ska också till exempel H&M eller Volvo för den delen när de har identifierat vad som är viktigt för deras prestanda så ska slutsiffran kunna gå och jämföra företagen emellan. Svårare än så är det inte. Och det är för att vi ska fokusera det vi gör störst skillnad. Då blir min fråga till er att ta med er hem. Vad blir då ert arv till kommande generationer företagsledare, kommande generationer beslutsfattare? Det arv vi hade är både positivt och negativt. Det arv vi kommer lämna kommer också vara av samma sort. Så är människans natur. Vi löser vissa problem, men vi skapar också nya. Och hela tiden kommer vi kunna lösa problemen. Jag är optimist. Jag tror inte alls att världen kommer gå under. Jag tror vi både kommer lösa det med global uppvärmning och fixa hållbara städer med mobilitetslösningar som utgår ifrån människans behov när det gäller välmående snarare än bara ha 
någonting att sitta i och, och, och röra sig fram vid utan verkligen se till att vi också mår bra. Jag tror att vi kommer lösa allt detta och jag tror att vår konsumtion kommer att förändras och kommer också stabiliseras så att också framtida generationer kan tillfredsställa sina behov. Det är min övertygelse. Tack. Tack så mycket Niamco för denna inblick i er stora verksamhet och hur ni har ställt om till någonting där hållbarhet är en självklar och integrerad del av verksamheten och av lönsamheten och av målen. Och också speciellt tack för att du lyfter fram de 17 av de globala hållbara utvecklingsmålen som ofta glöms bort. Därför att det är ju inte substantiellt som de andra. Jag är själv ambassadör för nummer sju om förnybar energi. Men det sjuttonde med innovativ samverkan är ju egentligen det kanske absolut viktigaste och dessutom det som precis den här konferensen handlar om. Så det jag var extra givande i ditt föredrag och nu ska vi se vad folk har bett dig att svara på. Um, se om vi kan scrolla lite upp och ner, men vi börjar med här längst ner. Um, om vi kan scrolla ner till den, för den kopplar på vad du sa på slutet. Mäta, det är väl ett reaktivt sätt att styra. Borde inte hållbarhetsarbetet vara proaktivt istället? Ja, och det kan det vara om man mäter och ser var man står för att sen kunna vidta åtgärder för att bli bättre. Och framförallt där redskapet ger oss möjligheter att simulera vilken typ av åtgärder vi ska vidta. Det är inte alltid som, jag menar, låt oss, vi jämför med politiken, den miljarden till cyklar i Stockholm. Är den använd på rätt sätt eller kunde den miljarden användas på ett annat sätt för att ge ytterligare kanske andra värden? Det vet jag inte, det vet nog inte de som fattade beslutet. Ingen har simulerat, ingen har ställt olika förslag bredvid varandra. Men att mäta för oss ett sätt att se, lyckades vi? med det vi sa att vi skulle lyckas med. Och ser vi progress hela tiden från år till år. Så vi sitter inte bara och väntar och ser vad som blev, utan vi, vi tar åtgärder för att få bättre resultat från år till år. Och lite i linje med den frågan så är det någon här som har undrat den här formen, den såg lite krånglig ut och yeah. kanske att man inte direkt har hem till köksbordet. Men kan man som en enskild person eller familj ha en hållbarhetssiffra och liksom en tydlig plan? Ja, det kan man ha. Jag är faktiskt projektledare för formeln här. Men det finns ju sätt att mäta. Vi har ju, vi, som jag sa, vi har ju då ett antal kvalitativa eh, frågor och kvantitativa. Det kvantitativa är ju lätt, det omvandlas ju bara, det är andelar. Och om vi säger att vi ska minska våra utsläpp med en viss andel, vi ska halvera eller vad det är, så är det ett sätt att mäta. Vi ska nå ett visst antal kvinnor inom OF så är det också väldigt lätt att mäta. Men sen börjar vi tala om det här. Arbetsmiljö. Ja, hur mäter man då bra arbetsmiljö? Då kan det finnas olika aspekter man ska mäta. Och vi tittar ju på det här via medarbetarundersökningen till exempel. Och, och för att få fram en sån prestanda så kan det ju behövas liksom både kvalitet och kvantitet. Ett antal olika parametrar som förvandlas till SPPI-värde genom Rush-metoden som det kallas. Så att det blir ett vetenskapligt sätt att mäta på. Och ja, visst kan man mäta vetenskapligt också sin familjs hållbarhetsprestanda. Men jag tror att det, det är så pass avancerat så att det är väl inte värt att göra det. Men det finns ju enklare appar där man matar in vad man gör för att få ut vilka utsläpp man orsakar. För det är ju någonting annat. Här mäter man ju mer än bara utsläpp. Men, men utsläpp tror jag är det många familjer kan bidra till att minska. Beroende på hur man konsumerar och, och hur man lever. Du, du är ju väldigt tydlig med att hållbarhet nu är integrerat i er, er affärsstrategi och att det är grunden är lönsamt med hållbarhet. Här är någon som frågar om en hållbarhet är lönsamt, säger du. Och exemplen du hämtar hem är de vi ofta hör om klimat och liknande. Men så vill man ställa er på lite svåra prover. Östersjöns övergörnad, fjällrävens överlevnad. Vad har du affären i detta? Ja, och där tror jag... En del kommer ju handla om den teknik som finns att använda och att man måste investera i den tekniken. Annat kommer faktiskt behöva mötas med lagar. Vad vill politiker värna det gemensamma som vi har och på vilket sätt? Så att jag är övertygad om att, att jag ser att hållbarhet är lönsamhetsaffär och hoppas att alla ska jobba på det sättet. Ja, men det är ju liksom bara nu. Det har precis bara börjat. Det är inte alla företag som ser på de här frågorna på det sättet. Men jag tror också att det finns smarta företag som inser att om inte vi börjar vi ta åtgärder nu så kommer man längre fram och mötas av lagar och avgifter och vad det nu kan vara. Därför att politiker kommer behöva leverera. När man fattar beslut i Paris, när man fattar beslut i New York när politiker gör det så betyder det att näringslivet kommer åläggas och leverera på det. Och när vi inte lyckas så kommer de behöva lagstifta eller helt enkelt ta betalt för att vi inte gör det de önskar att vi själva ska hitta på. Så att 
det här är ju inga problem att lösa. Det finns ju teknik och förmodligen finns det mycket pengar. Det kanske inte finns vilja idag fullt ut. Förr eller senare kommer någon se till att kräva att det görs. Och då kanske det handlar om lagstiftning och avgifter. Och apropå att du nämnde Parisavtalet för klimat så finns det med en specifik fråga här. Ni är ju en slags gun for hire och du berättade att ni har på sistone börjat tacka nej till projekt. Men det har varit mer dina nej-exempel var sånt som hade lokal, social eller miljömässig påverkan. Andra aktörer, till exempel Sjunde AP-fonden, de säger är det inte i linje med Parisavtalet, då är det på vår blacklist. Ja. Hur tänker ni där? Det tycker jag är bra. Jag tror verkligen att Finansinstitut kan göra väldigt stor nytta i vad är det de investerar i. När vi oroar oss för vilka beslut Trump har fattat att lämna Parisavtalet så är det många som säger att ni behöver inte oroa er för att företagen kommer fortsätta jobba enligt den överenskommelse. Men framförallt den som vill börja ta upp kol och den som vill fortsätta använda olja har en liksom... Det finns en synbar gräns för när den affären inte längre kommer vara lönsam. Och det beror ju just på, på, på det här med, med Parisavtalet. För vår del, som jag sa, vi är ingenjörer. Vi är till för att göra världen bättre. Så vi säger inte nej till projekt av olika andra anledningar än om vi tycker att man medvetet förstör. Ett sätt att beskriva det är det här med kolkraftverk som kommer upp under varje utbildning som jag håller för våra nya medarbetare. Så är det så här, hur kommer det sig att vi bidrar till att bygga nya kolkraftverk? Och vad vi gör är att vi bygger nya kolkraftverk, inte många. Vi har byggt, jag har varit med och hjälpt till att bygga en eller två i Kina. Och utifrån utgångspunkten att Kina jobbar hårt för att minska på sin fattigdom. Fattigdom är det överordnade målet som de här globala trenderna, globala utvecklingsmålen handlar om. Och vi vet att Kina är ett land som samtidigt investerar mest i världen i solkraft och möjligheten att lagra solkraft. De ser redan idag att det börjar bli billigt och kommer när som helst att skifta. Kolkraft är den kraftkälla som är stabil, kan liksom byggas fort, kan också läggas ner fort. Att bygga in sig i 75-åriga, 100-åriga vattenkraft eller kärnkraft ser vi inte som alternativ för Kina när det bara handlar om skiftet här. Men skulle vi bygga kolkraftverk i Europa? Nej, det skulle vi inte göra för här finns andra sätt och få tillgång till en stabil och bra energiförsörjning. Så Ursäkta, att vi... men jag får inte ihop den historien. Därför att du berätta. berättar om vind och sol ökar så väldigt, väldigt snabbt i Kina. Och det gör det, det har du alldeles ja. rätt i. Ja. Och så säger PCC nu att vi har 10-12 år på oss att vända utsläppen ja. kraftfullt ner. Ja. Ja. Och så medverkar ni till nya kolkraftverk. Inte kan de ja, men... avstänga om 8-10 år? Sol... Jo, det kan de visst vara. Är det sol... det man bygger för? Nej, men är det men är... Absolut. Sol och vind är sådana kraftkällor som inte kan användas med mindre än att vi har tekniken för att lagra den kraften. Mm. Annars är det ju kraftkällor vi har på dagen men inte på natten när det blåser men inte när det inte blåser. Och det går inte att bygga bort fattigdom med de kraftkällorna. Vad som återstår är ju då kärnkraft, vattenkraft. Det kan man också bygga om man vill. Vattenkraft påverkar miljö mer än man tror. Det gör vindkraften också för den delen. Och kärnkraften har sina problem. Jag möter folk som tycker kärnkraften har framtiden till för att vi kommer kunna återanvända avfallet om och, om och om igen så finns det ingenting kvar. Men jag tror på tekniken att lagra solkraft, att det är det som är på gång. Och jag tror på det skiftet som Kina är på väg till att åstadkomma. Men jag tror också att varje nation måste ha eh, energitillgång att få lita sin utveckling på. Spännande, den där dualismen i ert budskap tycker jag. Ja. Vi har ju också en fråga här om efter sommarens, vi inledde dagen med att prata om hur sommaren hade varit. Ser du en ändrad attityd och ändrade behov från era kunder? Att liksom, det där har blivit ett ändrat mindset. Kring... Ja, men sommaren var ju extrem ja, varm, extremt varm, extremt och det brann, brann extremt mycket. Eh, nej, jag ska, jag, nej, jag ska inte säga att jag ser exakta behov från våra kunder. Jag har inte hunnit träffa så många kunder sedan vi kom tillbaka. Men, men vi ser ju trenderna när det gäller för försäkringsbolag och andra som helt plötsligt inser att nej, men vi, ja, vi vill inte fortsätta eh, försäkra verksamheter som inte gör sina klimatriska analyser. Och det är självklart också ytterligare en kraft från ett annat håll som kommer trycka på att delvis måste vi minska riskerna för global uppvärmning, men delvis är vi där, vi ser redan förändringar. Vi måste kunna ha gjort de här riskanalyser och försäkra oss om att förlusterna blir så begränsade som möjligt. Det är ju det som försäkringsbolagen efterfrågar. Så att de flesta företag har inte gjort sådana klimatriskanalyser, men det är den vägen vi ser framåt. 
Ni utsågs ju igen, tror jag, till, eh, nyligen till en av Sveriges mest attraktiva arbetsgivare. Och eh, många tycker det vore spännande att jobba hos er. Eh, och vilka kompetenser är det, finns en fråga om det där borta, eh, vilka kompetenser är det framförallt som det är brist på, som ni saknar och söker? Eh, jag tror inte att vi har sådana, vi kan säga att vi saknar det här. Vi, vi anställer ungefär... 150-200 människor varje månad och vi förvärvar företag. Frågan är, vad behöver våra kunder? Och när en kund kommer till oss med en viss typ av utmaning som vi behöver lösa, ja, hittar vi inte då kompetens bland våra 10 000 medarbetare så är vi uppkopplade mot ett nätverk med 20-25 000 i princip egen företagare med den kompetensen. Men det är också i samma veva som vi anställer. Och ibland anställer vi människor inte för att det finns ett konkret projekt och arbete utan för att vi ser att det kommer att komma eller vi vill bygga upp det. Så att jag skulle säga att alla kompetenser är alltid efterfrågade och alltid viktiga. Det är bara att skicka in ansökan. Och kanske rent av våga se fram till dig under lunchen. Du stannar med oss under en del av dagen. Det gör jag. Perfekt. Tack, Tack. så mycket för detta, Nianko. Och... Tack snälla. Och innan ni nu reser på er för att ni ser på schemat att det är dags för lunch så vill jag bara switch to English and say that uh, thank you so much for Namco Sabuni. For those of you who didn't get everything she said, uh, hopefully somebody can translate to you during lunch. It, otherwise, just approach me and I'll give you a brief rundown of the main messages, at least to my mind, from Namco's speech. So there will now be lunch, and not only lunch, but also the poster session. They will both be two floors up, uh, and the coffee will be served in the poster session, which is a great way to get acquainted with some of the great proposals that are up there. After that, we will have the parallel sessions. That's two times five parallel sessions. If you open your little leaflet, you will see them. And the different rooms will be fairly easy to find. All these brilliant people who have orange red t-shirts that says crew will also be able to help you to find the room of your choice. As you know, we have not yet, most of us, registered for any of these sessions. They're free and open. Just choose whichever one you want to go to and then during the break choose the next one and then we'll meet here in the main session after the two parallel sessions. Please enjoy lunch. <laughs>